Uh, we're going to start with introduction of new employees. As you're aware, we like to introduce employees who have joined recently the department. And I, uh, we'll start with Susan. Good afternoon. I'm happy to announce the recent hire of Victoria And then, Kyle, you have some. I have the pleasure of announcing uh, three new staff to our team here at MDE. I want to start with Anna Vo from our uh, State and School Finance. Hello, my name is Anna. I went State and School Finance as a new auditor. I'm going to be working with the uh, early warning indicators for schools, uh, trying to get them to not go into deficit, and then schools also stay out of deficit once they get there. Um, I recently came from DTMB's internal audit office. I was there for two years and worked with MDE a little bit, so I already knew something. Then we have Amy Apple. Hello, everyone. Amy Apple from the School Yes, I am um, new to the Office of School Support. Uh, this really appreciating the program. Um, I am, uh, spent 14 years as a school food service director um, after graduating from Michigan State University, and I'm excited to put my operator's experience to good use as a financial analyst here with this nutrition program unit, where I will be the procurement lead, um, which is a new hot topic with the USDA, and um, we'll be implementing the procurement reviews for the next school year once they come into place and also assisting on the management reviews with the bill to review their financial analysis. Yeah. Finally, we have it with our child and food care program. Hi, I'm Lynn Cabot. I'm supervising the Child and Love Care Food Program. Um, I come to you um, from Swartz Creek, Michigan. Um, there I have been 13 years as an early childhood and community education director. Welcome to the new employees. Let's welcome them. Thank you for being here, and as a reward, you don't have to sit through the whole meeting. Unless you want to. <laughs> that is the reward. <laughs> All right, with that, we'll move to public participation in the State Board of Education meeting. Marilyn, are there individuals who would like to address the board? Yes, I have two forms, and if other people have forms, if you could pass those to me, that would be awesome. Um, I will let you know that you will have five minutes to address the board, and it's the board's practice that they do not respond um, to a back-and-forth conversation. With public comment, they may contact you at a later date. Um, I so the first person that we're going to hear from is Rahelio Landine, and he will be followed by Lamar Lemons. Good afternoon, Board Superintendent Whiston. Again, again, it's an honor to be before you. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity uh, immediately following the presentation of the guiding principles and the strategic goals that were adopted by this board last month. Uh, and do an expansion uh, relative to a presentation you permitted me to bring before you about 11 months ago on resource equity. Uh, all of the presentation this morning, presentations this morning actually reinforce much of what was in that solution and uh, also serve as a response to John's questions and Cassandra's issues in terms of so many of these things over the course of time that are recommendations that require new investments. I'm here to essentially remind you that the solution that was presented before you uh, uses existing resources and is a leveraged resource, uh, a leveraged solution that essentially comes out to a net zero uh, sum relative to what it provides to the students. Uh, <coughs> there are numerous uh, instances where if the solution had been adopted in certain districts already uh, in certain areas. We talked about chronic absenteeism today. We talked about all of these things that were what you heard just this morning alone, behavioral, mental health, and wellness uh, support services, for which we know there are not enough. Uh, that is included. 
I can also say to you as an update, this past summer, we added restorative justice PD for any district that adopts a solution. And I know Kyle referenced restorative justice. We based it on the Oakland model and the experience that we had in Ohio in terms of their, the Ohio project in the past. Uh, these are all things that are value added and that are built in. Uh, when I, I just wanted to let you know that looking at the updates, we are in accordance with the guiding principles and we are in alignment with each of the strategic goals and feel very confident that we can make a significant contribution to meeting those goals without any new money. And, and I know that that's important when we look at fiscal matters uh, in terms of what's available uh, for you. Uh, there was mention earlier about Michigan being in a position to be a model on this response to the Flint emergency. I would add to you that Michigan is also in a position to be a model on resource equity uh, relative to doing some things and turning some things around. I want to commend <coughs> Superintendent Whiston. Last night I attended an Ed Town Hall meeting in North, uh, Northeast Detroit, Gross Point, and he was very candid. He was very, uh, with conviction, principle, and, and resolve, straightforward about many situations that a lot of people have essentially danced around uh, in, in terms of education in Michigan. Uh, and, and it is with that same candor uh, that, that I hope, you know, he, he addresses everything that, he, that he's going to be doing and recommending to you in the upcoming proposal that he's preparing now based on those strategic goals and those guiding principles. Uh, I am especially uh, attracted to the can-do culture aspect of that. I would up the ante and, and uh, suggest to you that uh, everyone wants to and, and that you embrace the idea of a will-do culture as well uh, and, and see it through and, and have the political will and the courage to do the things uh, that are necessary. Uh, Superintendent Whiston, uh, on a broad uh, scale, mentioned <coughs> that uh, essentially Michigan has failed its students in many ways. And this is an opportunity to, uh, to add something that, that can bring some value back and, and to restore some confidence in the community in our public schools and in our public academies. Uh, so I would just uh, refresh you and, and invite you to revisit the resource equity solution which today has some upgrades and some add-ons that don't cost you anything else but support everything you've heard this morning and everything you heard last September and August and every presentation previous to that where all of the recommendations essentially reflect the same things, the need for technology, the need for internet access, the need for cultural competency, the need for restorative justice, the need for student assistance, behavioral wellness, and mental health programs. And all of those things are a part of this, and I'm just here to uh, ask you to revisit that and allow <coughs> us to be partners in contributing to the turnaround of Michigan schools. My time is up. Thank you for your attention. We look forward to continue to work with you. Thanks for being here. Our next speaker is Lamar Lamond. <coughs> I have all this paper is because I'm so 20th century, <laughs> you know, reflection of my age. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. I am uh, Lamar Lemons, a member of the Detroit Board of Education. I also happen to have the distinction of being a um, former legislator, and and so um, I come with a, a different uh, skill set uh, to uh, school board governance. Um, I'm here before you today to get a response from a uh, resolution to, to memorialize this body to take action that was submitted, um, that was adopted <coughs> by our body on November 6th and presented to you, um, I believe, in, in uh, your December meeting. Uh, and that was a resolution from the Detroit Board of Education to memorialize the state of Michigan in both its bifurcation authorities of the State Board of Education, which is Administration, Instruction, General Planning and Coordination, and the State Legislature. Obviously, you don't have anything to do with that directly, but uh, to remediate, reconcile, compensate the Detroit Public Schools to fully restore democracy and power as duly elected Board of Education under provisions outlined under the Constitution of the State of Michigan, Article 8, Section 3, and Article 9, uh, Section 25, 
through 32. That is the Headley Amendments because the state has been operating the Detroit Public Schools for uh, 14 of the last 17 years and therefore any uh, financial remediation would fall squarely on the state uh, in its, uh, <coughs> on the legislature portion of this. Um, we also believe and um, the, uh, we want you to be more assertive um, particularly with the in regards to the EAA, so-called EAA, which is in court, uh, the state argued that there was no EAA because they had violated the provisions. In court, they said there's an interlocal agreement from the state with Eastern Michigan University. I say from the state because they say uh, the Detroit Public Schools, which of course is operated and has been operated by the state. So the 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 failures again, uh, both prior to uh, the creation of the EAA in its operation. And, and by the way, for two years of that operation, the state operated the district illegally. And when I say illegally now, I mean it was found illegally in a court of law. So under the Baxter decision, it was found that the under the emergency financial manager did not have the authority to operate the district academically, but he did so to the detriment of the district and caused irreparable <laughs> harm. That is not hyperbole. That is the la actual language as uh, uh, that the judge uh, issued. Um, and so the things that we did ask of this body on the, um, and I believe at your December uh, meeting, I wasn't here, but um, members from the Detroit board were here. And it was to specifically um, get you to assert that the local boards have academic control. The reason there was an emergency financial manager because the Constitution would not permit an emergency manager over the authorities of the academic authorities of the school district. The authority is bifurcated at the top. The state board is over all leadership in general. So, they, so when they created a, a Public Act 72, it was because those experienced legislators on, prior to term, limit, uh, term limits understood that you could not, um, that the state uh, did not have such, a, that the legislature did not have such authority. So they could not impose an emergency manager, but could impose for its financial interest an emergency financial manager. And so the, uh, but bringing in neophytes <coughs> and the nerd who was, although a nerd, he was not a nerd in policy, um, they passed Public Act 4, and then they passed Public Act 436, which, uh, which uh, grandfathered the Detroit Public School District. So although PA 436 is called, called the um, Choice Act, there was no choice because we were grandfathered in. And if we seem a little uh, uh, hypersensitive to being grandfathered, if you, uh, as an African American, there was a grandfather clause that prevented us from voting. Uh, so uh, we were grandfathered and we were being prevented from voting in the city of Detroit for our duly elected school board. I would say that we're being disempowered because we, we're voted on, I was elected, same as Mike Duggan, same as Governor Snyder at the exact ta time as Governor Snyder. And so we would want you to follow through with the request as submitted um, um, by, the, by uh, the duly elected board of the Board of Education um, and to allow us to be over the uh, administration portion of the district which comes directly through uh, empowered by the state constitution through this body and not the governor. There's no way in the governor, if I include the sentence, uh, there's no way in the constitution that gives the governor the authority to operate a school district. You can read it backwards, forwards, any kind of way. He doesn't have that authority, but he is, he is doing that. Thank you. So I owe you an answer, Mr. Lemons, and I will get back to you. Thank you, sir. All right, with that, then we will move on to the Committee of the Whole. I'll return to the Committee of Whole, and next item on the Committee of the Whole agenda is a presentation on final approval of College for Creative Studies as an Educator Preparation Institution. The State Board of Education granted preliminary approval to the College of Creative Studies to prepare and recommend teachers in 2003. During its periods of preliminary and probationary approval, the college has continued to develop the program in response to the Committee of Scholars criteria. The Committee of Scholars is now recommending the College of Creative Studies be granted final approval as a Michigan Educator Prep Institution. This presentation comes to you today from Accountability Services, Deputy Superintendent Vanessa Kiesler. The next steps will be for the board to approve this at our February 9th meeting. 
And I actually don't see Vanessa sitting there. I see Leah <laughs> sitting there and Sean. Thank you. Uh, I'm Leah Breen. I'm the director of the Office of Professional Preparation Services. I'm Sean Kotke, consultant within OPPS. We are pleased to have uh, with us today uh, for this presentation two representatives of the College of Creative Studies. Uh, if you look into our audience, uh, Dr. Nancy Van <coughs> who is our chair of the Art Education Department, and Dr. Vince Carducci, who is Dean of Undergraduate Studies. Thank you. Okay. Um, before we get started, we've got two presentations here, first on College of, of Creative Studies and then on Baker College. And uh, I just want to remind you, we, uh, the board did approve a, a moratorium on new teacher preparation institutions a couple meetings back. Uh, these were these are institutions that were in the pipeline uh, part of the approval process on, on that. So this is not in the violation of the moratorium. Uh, this isn't a lifting of the moratorium and it's not contradictory to the things that uh, you've approved in past meetings. Uh, I will also mention that we will have a third institution and, and a third and final institution uh, later this spring uh, seeking final approval. So a little bit of context, the uh, College for Creative Studies has two campuses in Midtown Detroit, rolling 1,400 students. Uh, on the left, the Walter and Josephine Ford campus, on the right, the Alfred Taubman Center for Design Education. Uh, College for Creative Studies strives to provide students with the tools needed for successful careers in dynamic and growing creative industries, has a legacy of recognition in art and design education, has been recognized by Bloomberg Business Week among the top design schools in the world. Supplies talent to numerous industries, including transportation, film, and animation, uh, advertising and communications, and consumer electronics. Graduates are exhibiting artists, teachers, design problem solvers, innovators, and creative leaders in business. We have some images here of their sculpture studio on the Ford campus, the graphic design studio on the Taubman Center, and the fibers studio. At the on the Ford campus, so the art education program uh, and, and College for Creative Studies, I will note, has a very unique mission to prepare exclusively art educators uh, for our art <coughs> teachers. Uh, requires a dual major in an arts field uh, as well as in art education. Uh, according to their website, uh, this is probably states it better than I could, in order to teach art, you must first become an artist. At the College for Creative Studies, you must choose a major area of study within our 11 major curricula. As you learn how to become an educator over the course of your stay, you will also be mastering the craft of your chosen major, making you a professional educator and artist or designer. bit there. Um, it employs an interdisciplinary approach uh, to arts education um, as well as teaching art. Uh, in order to effectively teach art to elementary, middle school, and high school students, educators must know how to educate students across all disciplines of art, including art history, criticism, two-dimensional and three-dimensional digital art forms, uh, and at CCS, candidates are educated as cross-disciplinary artists, so they're not narrowly prepared. Um, the CCS has a very close working relationship with the Henry Ford Academy's School for Creative Studies. This is a public charter school at the middle and high school level, enrolls more than 800 students in a high performance academic curriculum, focusing on art and design. Provides students the opportunity to develop artistic abilities and explore <coughs> the many careers available uh, to those with artistic <coughs> skill. As a public school academy, all enrolled students attend tuition free. Just a reminder of the three-stage process uh, that we have in place at the um, Department of Education for educator preparation institution approvals. We begin with the preliminary uh, phase of approval under the mentorship of uh, another institution. In this case, the board granted preliminary approval to the College for Creative Studies to begin development of a program under the mentorship of Hope College in May of 2003. Um, in May 2014, this body approved their request for probationary approval. What this allows them to do is operate independently of their mentor institution and recommend candidates directly uh, to the Department of Education for certification. 
as well as be evaluated on the state's uh, educator performance, uh, excuse me, educator preparation institution performance score. Um, they've posted great numbers uh, on that and now are ready for final approval. And then the next step in that case will be seeking CAPE accreditation, so national accreditation to the Council for Accreditation of Educator Preparation with a target of 2019 <laughs> for achieving that. And so our recommendation, the state superintendent intends to recommend College for Creative Studies for final approval as an educator preparation institution in the February 2016 meeting. Any questions? I, I just wanted to commend uh, the CCS on their 100% graduation rate for uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, the, the Michigan Test for Teacher Certification. I, I, I'm a musician myself and I have a master's from school music at university. And it's always terrific to see the artists in the world acing the test. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Rick Joseph? I just want to echo the statement. Kathleen. I want to echo the statement you made. In order to, to teach art, you must first become an artist because whenever you have that integrity of practice and, and pedagogy, it makes for a rich teaching and learning environment in any discipline. So I just want to salute you on that. Kathleen Strauss? I'm well, I'm Michelle? I'm very happy to see this coming to a conclusion, <laughs> a successful <laughs> conclusion to CCS. Because I know the students are great teachers. I've seen them in the teaching in the classroom, so it's really impressive. So, that's great. Michelle, please. Um, how does it distinguish itself from Wayne State's uh, teacher prep program and art uh, program? Uh, because it's literally right across the street. So why two university schools doing the same thing so close to each other? Yeah, I think that's. Yeah. Do you want to talk about how you distinguish yourself from Wayne State's program, right. Right. and then we can talk about? Um, um, we we focus on art education. Um, Wayne State, although they are a, a, a very good education um, program, both in their undergrad and, and graduate programs, um, their art education program has an art therapy um, mm -hmm. focus. Ours has a um, um, production focus, um, and we our majors are. Um, our fine arts majors are um, graphic designers, product designers, um, illustrators, fine artists, sculptors. So, so we have a wider gamut of uh, specialists in, in the field of art education. Um, many of the um, uh, Wayne State um, art education graduates come over and work with us as well. So we have a good relationship. So, but there are there are those disciplines at Wayne State and their art department. In their fine, they have fine yes. arts, yeah, more, yeah. more likely have fine arts than, right. than the design fields and we feel that um, our art education today is going in the direction of design um, uh, in the K-12 system with, with the introduction of technology and the tools um, that are available so our, our, our people are very well versed in that as well. So. Thank, you. Thank you very much. All right, so the next item on the Committee of the Whole agenda is presentation and final approval of Baker College as an educator prep institution. The State Board of Education grant an extension of probationary approval to Baker College to prepare and recommend teachers on October 14, 2014 for a period of three years. During its period of probationary approval, Baker College Education Prep Institution performance score status has shown steady improvement and is now posted multiple years at a satisfactory level. The Committee of Scholars is now recommending that Baker College be granted final approval as a Michigan Educator Prep Institution, and we have Leah and Sean. Great. Thank you. And also joining us today, and we're pleased to introduce you to uh, Dr. Chris Schramm, Dean of the School of Education, Baker College, uh, Ms. Amanda Bladzik, the Certification Officer for Baker College, and uh, Dr. Carol Dowsett, uh, Vice President of Academics at Baker College's Owasso campus. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to share you, with you a little bit about where uh, Baker has been and where they're heading. Um, and again, this reminder of the, the process. Uh, they received their preliminary approval uh, under the mentorship of Madonna University in 2001. Uh, and then initial probationary approval in November of 2011 uh, by this board. 
This was renewed in November of 2014 uh, in order that they not lose state approval because uh, it was coming to a, a three-year conclusion. Uh, while Baker College made some significant changes to uh, its program, changes that have had a very positive effect on the different metrics that we measure in the Office of Professional Preparation Services uh, for teacher quality. Uh, two in particular, um, it, as you may be familiar, Baker College has campuses all around the state. Uh, they consolidated efforts and teacher preparation to three centers for excellence at Muskegon, Owasso, and Clinton Township campuses. Students may start at various campuses and come, but then they finish their programs at one of those three centers for excellence. Uh, they've also hired additional faculty content area specialists to improve uh, alignment of the programs across multiple campuses to a core set of standards and outcomes. Um, and the Committee of Scholars that was assigned to uh, by this board to evaluate Baker's progress toward final approval saw those uh, changes and saw the data that followed from them uh, as very, very positive and have now recommended uh, Baker for final approval as an educator preparation institution. Um, this is a, a little bit of a graphic that we had uh, the last time we spoke with you regarding <laughs> Baker's uh, renewal of probationary approval. Um, there was a period of time in which it's on the educator, uh, sorry, the EPI performance score. Uh, it was at risk uh, during 2013 and 14. Baker College engaged in a serious needs assessment uh, that led to those program improvements that I just described. They were visited in March of 2014 by TAC, the Teacher Education uh, Accreditation Council, which is now CAPE, uh, and then were uh, uh, accredited by CAPE and in the uh, fall of 2014 for a full five-year accreditation period, and they will also be have their reaffirmation of accreditation in 2019. Uh, in 2014, Baker posted a satisfactory score on the, the EPI performance score, uh, and that continued in 2015 with steadier improvement. And so we <coughs> seek now move, that they move forward to final approval, <coughs> the last piece in the approval uh, picture. Questions? All right, well, we certainly uh, will look forward to the recommendations and uh, thank the two colleges for being here today yes. and for presenting. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Next, we move to the approval of the State Board of Education <coughs> minutes. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of December 8, 2015. <laughs> so moved. It's been moved and it's been supported. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. President's report. Thank you. Um, well, obviously we had a robust discussion of the Flint situation and said our piece about the complex of forces that got us to the horrible outcome. But I thought Pam and others of you had specific, helpful ideas of how we can continue to encourage the state together, working together to really wait in there and meet the real needs and uh, you know, particular needs of affected children and families, um, which are profound. So maybe we can, I, we talked informally about having those um, suggestions put together so that we can make sure that we're all paying attention to them and as the interagency group. You're a part of that interagency group is working. We can make sure that uh, we're, we're aggressively attending to folks needs in every way. Um, Detroit is, is a huge um, piece of work for all of us, uh, Detroit schools. We didn't get legislation introduced um, and it is not yet that would help solve some of the financial and organizational problems. I know, uh, at least from my point of view, this there is urgency and you were seeing it and every day about <coughs> attention to those issues. There are huge structural issues that are driving the financial and now what is a learning crisis, and that's what we should be focused on. The kids aren't learning. 
um, and the teachers sick out, while well, we do not encourage teachers to sick out, it is drawing attention to the conditions in those schools that are affecting kids' learning. Um, and so, one a feature of what's driving those learning distress is the they don't have the adequate resources in the Detroit public schools with the share that's going to pay off the debt. Uh, they can't afford teachers and they can't afford supplies and they can't create a learning environment that is um, helps kids learn. And we have to understand the reality of that. Uh, the other feature, and I was looking at the coalition's recommendations and you know the governor and others, legislators have been trying to develop a, uh, a plan for bringing some rationality to this marketplace of public schools, which we have in Detroit, charter, public, GPS, other schools. Um, the coalition's report was reminding us that we have created a rather haphazard marketplace with all these entities providing public education that since 2000, 230 Detroit schools had been either closed or reconfigured. 100 new schools had been opened or converted. Some neighborhoods have way too many schools. Some have too few to serve their residents. And the performance of all of these schools is not consistently good. Some are good, excellent, some are bad. Uh, and we have different quality results and outcomes because of this. <coughs> so, I mean, from our point of view, and certainly my point of view, as we've passed our resolutions of encouragement, we need to fix the finances, we need to attend to the debt so that they are resources that can go into the classroom, and we need to have some version of a Detroit Education Commission or some governance that uh, ideally uh, elected or appointed by people who are the voters of Detroit that brings some management for quality to all these public schools that are educating Detroit's children. Um, and I know given what's been going on, Brian and others of us are eager to listen and understand what the Detroit teachers are saying. Brian's going to talk about it. He's going to incur some meetings and meetings with the emergency manager and meetings with the mayor and listen to the Detroit educators, but also figure out what the department can do, what the emergency manager can do. And, but I think ultimately what we need to do is encourage attention and action uh, from uh, Lansing on how we work <coughs> constructively and effectively on those two, for the finances, the debt, and some organization of the public school marketplace that helps quality education be expected. So. You know, I think at some point, we either after legislation is introduced or if it's not introduced to encourage it, we should have a special meeting dedicated to this topic, try to help understand <coughs> what's driving the financial success that we're seeing, uh, the direction of the kind of um, uh, legislative uh, agenda that is most helpful and understand better what's going on in Detroit and help draw attention to quality, effective, constructive uh, solutions, which I think are urgent and getting more urgent by the day. So I hope that we'll uh, figure out the most constructive version of that to, to pursue. Um, hopefully we'll turn to more forward lurking and positive things. Uh, our next meeting, as Sir Brian will remind us, we'll look at, and you know, the board and others were discussing the top 10 strategies so that we can move <laughs> proactively on things that improve educational outcomes all over Michigan. and. Uh, be focused on what those are, and I think we've got a good good process, Brian, and appreciate everybody's participation in that so that we can look ahead. What do we do together to uh, be a high-performing state in terms of our learning outcomes? Uh, we've got a ways to go. I think another opportunity we have, and we've discussed it a bit, is we now have new federal education legislation, and uh, we have the chance to get accountability right. I mean, and we have a chance to devise a system that works to improve uh, learning outcomes. And I trust and I know we will engage our educator community in what would a, an accountability system that uh, supported learning and built capacity to improve schools. Uh, like I remember some of us looked at the Massachusetts uh, system where when during the school turnaround the office um, takeover discussion. They have a, um, there are models and approaches for how you can help schools that aren't struggling uh, build their ability to improve and build their capacity and support the teacher training that is needed to deliver outcomes. So I know we have a chance to get accountability right and we can define it and it will be a, hopefully a process that we get a lot of help with. Uh, 
forward to do our version of a, uh, an education improvement system that's helpful. Um, lastly, the good recommendations that we talked about last time coming out, the post-secondary attainment work and report uh, include uh, elements that I know will be pursuing and reinforcing in top 10 about enhancing counseling, enhancing counselor guidance, college and career readiness, uh, uh, support, expanded early post-secondary college credit taken, and many things that implicate K-12 that are part of getting more people, 60% of our people by 2025, earning a credential that gives them a chance to play in the marketplace. So uh, much to do there, and we're not always turning to uh, the future, but we have hopefully the chance to work on some of those important agendas uh, in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, report of the superintendent. So social studies standards. MDE staff has finalized a list of about 15 focus group participants representing people from various uh, perspectives regarding social studies, including local school districts, ISDs, colleges, universities, civil rights, law, and legislators. There will be a series of meetings uh, to identify issues with the articulation content, grade level appropriateness, and other concerns that we've had. We anticipate that the result will end up with a set of proposed social studies standards that will be ready to set out for public comment uh, early in the spring. And so the board will have more information on that shortly. Top 10 and 10, we continue to go through a process of inviting all the constituent groups out there in the business, education, and think tank <coughs> world to come up with the best plan possible to move Michigan forward in the top 10. And we'll have that presentation at your February board meeting. And from there, after the February board meeting, we will be taking that and turning it into a strategic plan and then operationalize it so that we can move forward. We'll have documents uh, that will talk about what we can do as a state board and department and what we need the legislature and governor to do, uh, as well as uh, other interest groups. So it's been a very exciting process. We've had a lot of engagement, and I think there's a lot of excitement in the education community coming together to focus on an agenda that we all can get behind to make Michigan a top 10 performing state. And it aligns really perfectly with the new law at the federal level that give us much more flexibility. So we're going through a process right now as a department to understand this new flexibility, understand this new law. And I think it's really going to give us an opportunity to let our top 10 drive where we go uh, in the future educationally and for the new reauthorization. So I think we're really set up uh, to really make a difference, I think. Uh, John, you brought up Detroit. We know it's been a tough situation over these last few weeks with a growing number of teachers calling in sick. I have sent out a couple press releases saying that I am encouraging teachers to be in the classroom. We know that the kids in Detroit need to be in class learning, but we also appreciate and understand what teachers are going through, and we do want to understand what they're going through. So I did attend a session last night where we heard from some teachers. I will, uh, along with others, be going to Detroit over the next <coughs> sometime this week for a meeting to, to further look into what's going on. Uh, we'll talk as a board and uh, department what we can do in a future meeting maybe to highlight and have an understanding of the financial crisis and what's going on so that we can continue to make recommendations and help drive in a positive way uh, a better future for the for Detroit. The mayor is today visiting the affected schools along with some of his departmental people to look at the schools to see uh, what is going on in terms of the facilities and we look forward to meeting with him and hearing what he's found. I'll update the board on my meeting and I will work with the, the agenda setting committee uh, on where we move forward together as a board. But I think whatever we do we need to uh, do it as we have been doing in a meaningful way to move the conversation in a helpful way to, to gain an understanding of what's going on and to come up with a set of recommendations so that we're positively uh, being part of the process to resolve these issues that are in fact impacting kids and our teachers and our parents in Detroit and other school districts quite frankly around the state. So I look forward to the continuing good conversation on that. With that, we'll go to uh, Rick Joseph, Teacher of the Year, for his report, please. Rick. Thank you, Brian. As a National Board Certified Teacher, I'm very aware of the importance of, of evidence um, and the use of evidence in order to um, demonstrate 
effective teaching and learning. And so one of my great thrills as Michigan Teacher of the Year, of course, is to be able to visit classrooms around the state. And I'm very aware of the fact that time is ticking for me. So I only have about five <laughs> months left. And, and as you all know, it takes a while to figure out how everything works. And I'm finally beginning to understand how everything works. And so I'm trying to. <laughs> Will you let um, us know? Can you share that with us? Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't mean I have any solutions, but I'm beginning to understand. So I guess my point is, is I'm really trying to visit um, as many schools as I can throughout the state, both in urban, suburban, and rural settings. I'm trying to um, be sensitive to all the different constituencies that we serve, and they are vast and numerous. So um, last December, in early December, there was a gathering of teacher leaders, over 200 teacher leaders at the Kellogg Center called the ESET 2 Michigan convening. And we were graced with the presence of your pre uh, our board president, Mr. John Austin, who spoke about the important uh, role that this board plays in supporting public education throughout the state of Michigan. And it was very inspiring for us. You recognize Ellie, Emily Polonsky, who's spoken many times, who's a finalist for Michigan Teacher of the Year. Melody Arabu, our Teacher of the Year from last year. Gary, uh, from two years ago. Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly also um, echoed his concern for um, special education. We heard from Eileen Weiser and, and Michelle Fecto about the important role that, that, that um, legislators and board members need to play as well as representatives here, consultants here at the MDE as we all work together in order to support public education throughout the state. I was able to give the keynote speech and of course I read from the official book of the Michigan Teacher of the Year, The Junkyard Wonders by Patricia Polacco. The next day I was um, at the Kent Intermediate School District. They have a leadership <laughs> academy which trains teacher leaders and empowers teachers to understand that they have the opportunity to not only be classroom teachers and serve children each day, but also to um, serve at the building-wide level and at the, at the district and statewide level as advocates for public education. Traditionally in public education, teachers think that they either have to go the union route to be union um, stewards in their buildings or go into administration in order to have leadership positions. But um, with the advent of teacher leadership programs, there's more of an awareness of other paths. Um, I was graced with my sister, Suzanne. That's my sister, in case you can't tell the fam family resemblance. Uh, mm -hmm. My big sister, Sue, is a paraeducator in Kentwood schools, and she was able to join us there. Um, at the Office for Professional um, Preparation Services, um, co winter conference, I was able to um, conduct a session regarding students who have ADD and ADHD and the ways we can meet their needs um, as upwards of 25 to 30 percent of, of, of our students in some schools have attention issues. And so these conversations with teachers around practice and our ability to effectively reach them through a, a number of important instructional strategies was very, very helpful and meaningful. Um, I visited Paul Galbensky, former Michigan Teacher of the Year at the Oakland Schools Technical Campus and learned about, um, about the, the role that, that college and career ready um, education serves throughout our state. And we just heard from the president of Baker College and, and how important it is that kids are ready uh, for the workforce and that we have options for them. And so as many of you know, especially those of you that were here when Paul was Teacher of the Year, there are a lot of very meaningful experiences and educational offerings that exist um, at these uh, career and technical education centers. It was very profound. Um, and I was very impressed because I was simply unaware. And, and one of the things that I get to do as Michigan's Teacher of the Year is I get to see for myself the kinds of practices that exist throughout our state, which are frankly very inspiring. The Lincoln Street Alternative Schools and Alternative High School in the Birmingham Public School System, and I only went there because um, I know people who work there. It's in my home district. But these teachers literally save children's lives. These are kids who drop out of school, who see no future for themselves, um, but because of alternative education environments, they are able to um, form relationships, deep relationships, because they have small class size and they're able to really personalize and differentiate instruction. This young woman was, was a, a high school dropout who re-entered um, public education through the alternative school and wound up being very successful as evidenced there by her meeting with President Obama. Um, they understand the critical power of relationships, as all of us in this room do, and, and the reality that we need each other and that we, we, we function best in community is what resonated with me and, and I would imagine resonates with any teacher in any alternative education setting. Um, and of course, the teachers are extraordinarily dedicated and, and they never stop teaching. Um, I then went to Northern Macomb County and I was very inspired by the program there at Armada Schools. We heard from 
um, Phil Jankowski, the assistant superintendent in Armada, and his superintendent, um, and the two of them t toured me around Ar Armada, and it's, I was happy to get into more of a rural district because, of course, I was able to see the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school all in one day. But they have some very dynamic programs. Every high school student has the opportunity to go through a college and career ready um, environment as well as traditional college preparation uh, in, in, in anticipation of, 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 um, of college life. They have re retained their instrumental music program um, which is somewhat unique to, to, to uh, other schools in Macomb County who have had to jettison those programs. The Aperture Paxton is a Milken award-winning educator, and there were a number of practices that I saw that, that again, reaffirmed my faith in public education. Um, and it, they have, as was mentioned last month at our meeting in December, they have on-site admissions, which is very meaningful and motivating. They have progressive learning spaces there. They're doing some um, very innovation, innovative work in terms of alternative energy sources and, um, and then traditional things that we all would be familiar with, such as drama. Um, I was recognized at the Educator Appreciation Night at the University of Michigan at Chrysler Arena. I had the, uh, the tremendous pleasure of spending some time with Eileen Weiser, um, and, and we took a break at halftime and had an opportunity to sort of wax philosophical about the state of public education uh, here in, in our state, but also talk about some concrete steps that, that need, to be, um, need to be addressed in order to remedy some of these systemic issues that, that we certainly face. But, but this was, was a thrill. As a graduate of the university, the class of 1990, um, this, was, this was a once-in-a-lifetime experience for me. Um, I'm, I'm proud to say that the Junkyard Wonders Literacy Project continues. My goal with this is to put this book in the hands of teachers and students across the state of Michigan and really to enshrine this notion that all children are geniuses and that it's up to us as teachers to sort of uh, find out what that genius is and help them to uh, pull that out through a lot of hard work and dedication, which is what teachers across our state do every day. And so um, a number of people have been donating books uh, through a website on my, um, I should say a link on my Facebook page. My website continues to grow and evolve, and I've, um, and I've particularly been leaning on the blog feature of my website. So my idea is, is that when I go out to visit schools, that I will do a report. I take a lot of photographs, and I realize the power of images. And so you can see um, that what I was just addressing in terms of my report for this last month is reflected visually and textually in my, in my blog. And then I tweet that out and I, um, and I certainly tag a, a number of people, whether it's the board members at this table who are active on Twitter um, and other, other interested politicians, um, decision makers, and, and local um, education leaders so that they're aware of the amazing things that are happening throughout our state um, in public education. So I look forward to a continued um, robust experience as the Teacher of the Year um, in, the, in the weeks and months to come. Very right, good, Rick. Appreciate it. Yep. I just want to show, say that, that Rick has shown extremely high restraint because I understand he has a video of being on the floor. <laughs> 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 and I didn't see it because I thought he was going to be at halftime. So I, you know, I admire you for not showing that. All right. <laughs> Are you going to do any Thank slam dunk, Eileen? <laughs> we, we didn't get into it. I thought that's what he was going to do. But, you know, he was on before. All right, next up is discussion action items, state and federal legislative report. <coughs> Ari Ackley will provide us an update on state and federal legislative issues, and then Cassandra Albrecht, our chair of the board's legislative committee, will share an update on the January 4th legislative committee meeting, and we'll probably hear from Kathleen Strauss on NASB. So, uh, Martin, Hardy. The uh, legislature's been in recess for three weeks to come back tomorrow, actually, and so there really hasn't been any legislative action to speak of um, since the last meeting, other than what they did at, in, um, can't, at the end of the session in December, they passed one bill, which the legislative committee did um, make a statement on at the January 4th meeting, and I'll hand it over to Cassandra. All right, yeah, so there's, there's actually two things that um, came out of the latest legislative committee meeting. Um, the one you're, uh, mentioning is Senate Bill 571 because of the timing and the fact that the chances of it going to the or having either vetoed or signed by the governor was um, eminent 
Uh, we exercised our right to send a statement on behalf of the legislative committee as opposed to bringing it to the full board. And essentially what it said was simply that we were urging uh, Governor Snyder to veto Senate Bill 571. Um, this bill would prohibit the use of public funds to provide information to voters related to a local ballot question within 60 days of an election. And we're concerned about the impact this will have on the electorate's ability to make informed decisions that impact their local communities. Um, just in the way of a personal uh, statement about this, um, uh, unfortunately, Governor Snyder did uh, end up signing <coughs> this bill into law. I was the one who had requested the statement because uh, essentially I was concerned about the impact that um, this language, particularly in the bill, would have on uh, voters' ability to be uh, informed about things that they were being asked to vote on. Uh, but even I did not realize how quickly this bill would impact political speech. Um, just this weekend, I witnessed a discussion among local school board members questioning what they can say, when and how they can say it, on what forum, and, and also what sanctions or ramifications they would be subjected to personally if they said something in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, these are local elected officials who are self-censoring themselves and uh, out of fear um, of basically their state government. And as someone with a PhD in communication with a focus on political communication, I just want to reiterate this is protected political speech. Um, but when you have elected officials who are um, censoring themselves, even though they're the people who probably know more about a ballot proposal than anyone else because they're afraid to speak, uh, it, it does seem like it's, it's an assault on the First Amendment rights, whether that's the intent of the bill or not. Um, because they're, they're, they're not saying something out of fear of reprisal um, from their government. And so I understand that there may be a federal court challenge. It's being discussed now. I personally hope that that happens and we'll do whatever I can to help. Um, this was not why I had suggested that we do this statement, but uh, I was really kind of taken aback this weekend when I saw this conversation <coughs> going on and how detrimental that this could potentially be. So I, I just, I'm sorry I diverted there, but I wanted to make that that personal statement. Cassandra, before you leave that, I do want to also add that I did uh, ask, contact the governor's office and ask for <coughs> know as well. So I just want you to know I did that. I, I know that the legislation does not prohibit website communication. It prohibits paid, um, you know, communication. And it also has nothing to do with uh, news outlets or other uh, entities that may wish to send out materials, whether it's a nonprofit, an advocacy group, a union. So what I think we should do as a board, as a department, I think we should get legal clarification on this. I think that that is a good role for us. Um, it's legislation that's, that's passed, and if there's questions that board members have about their personal ability to advocate in their elected office, that's just totally wrong that they're concerned about that. I mean, that is devastating. Mm -hmm. And that's not uh, anything that was uh, part of this legislation. I've heard over and over again that it prohibits all <laughs> communication by anybody, which it doesn't. And I think finding out what is permittable now, uh, regardless of a legal challenge, people are getting ready to either, either they're close already within 60 days of millages, right. or they are getting ready to. And it's not fair to them to be hearing hearsay or to be worried about something that isn't in existence. I really feel strongly about I will that. Go I, I would think uh, that is a great idea, and I really appreciate you saying that. Because I think where the fear is coming in is, okay, if, if it's a televised meeting, does that mean that I am precluded? Not if they didn't televise it. In other words, if it's public access, I think you're okay. I mean, I'm, I'm saying this. Th that's the, that's hey, what we're hey, getting hey, into. Hey, let's right. interpretation to put it on your so, side. So, so I think what's happening is rather than say, okay, let's, let's talk about the nuances of what we can and can do, it's so let's just not problem. talk about it at all. And that's not fair. And that's self-censorship, and yeah. we can't have that. Yeah, that's not a So problem. we will get a legal opinion. Given the conversation we had this morning about um, the importance of actually raising money and spending it on things like infrastructure and transportation and education and public health and, you know, the chilling effect that this has on the ability of communities to raise money <laughs> and, and communicate about millages for everything that people care about in their communities, from parks to schools to... Uh, 
uh, whether they have uh, ability to move <coughs> around uh, transportation is is it so unfortunate? I mean, it's just so counter to what yeah. we need to reanimate, which is an ability to collectively do things that do that to, to the health of people. Well, I, I understand the governor is suggested to the legislature that they clarify this language. Yes, he has done that. He did do that. It, but, uh, mm -hmm. Maybe some of the things that you're bringing up, Eileen, maybe they're misinterpretations, maybe they aren't. Uh, it would be helpful to yeah. repeal it would be better, but uh, repeal that <laughs> section. And maybe be if there had been some public comment. I mean, I don't understand why it was done in such a rushed right, manner. Right, it was, it was really outrageous. Without any discussion or input, it, 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 it really it seems very suspect to me. Right, it was added at the last minute with, from a 12-page yeah. bill that became a 58-page bill with last minute, no hearings, no meetings, no yeah. nothing. Yeah. So it was really a bad thing to do, and I, I would recommend that if we, want, if we say anything, we should say we sh they should repeal that section, at least that section. The whole bill was not so good. But that, that was All right, I Cassandra, you had something else? Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Um, the second thing that we had was a follow-up from the conversation we had at the last meeting, which was about the counselor legislation. Uh, we discussed doing a statement then, but um, I in particular, and I think some other people maybe as well, had some questions um, primarily about the timing and that's written specifically into the bill. After discussing it with um, the staff at MDE, who clarified that they can go back and if it's if we get to a certain point where um, those specific dates are not enough time, we can request that instead they do something more generic. So, based on that, we are bringing before you um, just a short statement that says the State Board of Education supports passage of House Bill 4552 a bill to require training in the college preparation and selection process for school counselors. However, we encourage the legislature to specify any funding requirements for this legislation, as well as adjust implementation dates to reasonably correspond to the actual passing of the legislation. As an added note, the SBE encourages the legislature to address the high student to counselor ratios experienced in Michigan public schools as part of an overall strategy. That last part was added, I believe, by Michelle, um, out of a concern that education for counselors is wonderful, but when you have 600 students that you're working with, um, you, you don't have enough time to really put that education into practice. Yeah, I would have liked to make that stronger, actually, that <laughs> final sentence. All right, I have Eileen and then Rick. I just see they want to add a couple of hyphens because I read it as student to counselor for a minute. Either do student slash counselor or student to counselor with some hyphens. It's small, but uh, it gives you the context. Okay. That it, Eileen? All right, Rick. I just wanted to echo the the incredibly incredible importance of having school counselors available at all levels because even in Birmingham, which is a privileged district, as you all know, school counselors do not exist at the elementary level. Period. <coughs> Until a child gets to sixth grade, do they even have access to a school counselor? And so that puts a significant burden on classroom teachers in order to meet the social emotional needs of the students. And so I, this, I think, is, you know, the priority ought to be in, in enabling districts and, and in certainly encouraging districts to um, prioritize the presence of counselors, but also certainly to have the funding in place to be able to enact that. All right. So is, do you need a motion to approve as amended or a motion to so approve? Moved been moved and seconded any further discussion seeing none all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed the same motion carries Sandra anything else to report that is it all right moving on to comments by State Board of Education members any comments by board members was I supposed to say something about oh yes you were going to say oh, yeah, something about NASB. NASB. yes you were I all know that uh, <laughs> ESS a act was Past, and it keeps a lot of what was in No Child Left Behind. It keeps the uh, annual testing in elementary schools and once in high school. It keeps standardized testing. Uh, but in local di lo states can develop their own tests. So we're back sort of to what we had before, where some states would have very low uh, standards, and others like us will have high standards and then we'll see what happens. Uh, 
Yeah, I remember when years ago, before we, before No Child Left Behind, we also we had high standards then already. I got a call from a reporter saying, what do you think of Michigan having so many failing schools? I hadn't seen the report. I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, but let me tell you, Arkansas doesn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, that's the answer. We have high standards. They don't. But uh, we still do. Anyway, uh, the Department of Education, Federal Department of Education is working to transition from No Child Left Behind to ESSA. Uh, every child is success, every student success act. Yeah, I have to remember the new name. And uh, they're working to transition in a reasonable way and make everybody get everybody to understand it. CSSO has put out material. With, uh, they both have had, uh, NASB, they both had webinars. And the webinar was, NASB's was quite informative. But it, it's gradually going to be implemented, and we'll, we'll get information right all along to see what we have to do, how the waivers, how the waivers are, are treated under the new law, and what we have to do to change anything if we do. So that's about where it is now. I think we do a little hiatus during the holidays. Hi, Lope. I just have a question on the on the on what you reported. Uh, when when they're talking about the states are going to have the the authority or the privilege or I don't know what you want to call it, whatever, uh, to uh, formulate the tests, do they mean the state department or the school districts in the state? It means the state department of education has more flexibility in designing. But certainly we are going to have a very thorough process to get input from teachers and administrators and parents and community mm -hmm. in terms of the direction that we should head. But again, aligning top 10 and 10 is where, and the things that we're trying to accomplish in there is, is kind of the roadmap. Right. Well, Go ahead, Lope, finish. Okay, okay, and, and there's uh, just three other little things. Um, last uh, month, Esther Torres came with me to the to the state board meeting, and and sh I want to report that she uh, accomplished her mission, and she's a resident of the United States of America, and and she was able to go to Mexico to visit her family oh, very uh, cool. for, for the holidays. So that was good, and then today Hassani Hayden was going to come to our board meeting and uh, and speak uh, in public comment. Hassani, uh, five years ago, entered a writing contest <coughs> with the Committee to Honor Cesar Chavez. He is from Godfrey Lee, and he won. Uh, and so uh, five years later, I see him in a restaurant, and he saw me, and he comes and says, are you Miss Ramos? Yes. Do you remember me? Well, where did I meet you? And he says, well, I, I, was, I won the writing contest. The great thing about um, Hassani is that uh, in two weeks he goes to Harvard. He, he, he was accepted at Harvard. He's very excited. There's a, a big group of African American students from the area that were accepted at Harvard, and he's one of them. So he wanted to come and tell us how um, grateful he is to uh, all his teachers and, and having been part of the public school system standing young man. And then I want to also uh, thank Rick, uh, our Teacher of the Year. One thing that Rick is doing that I truly appreciate, and I have s said this before, uh, that all, everything that I see in the state level as a state board member, and I realize that I've been in the state board for three years already, uh, everybody does in a silo. Uh, if we go visit a school, we go by ourselves. If, if we, whatever, we do it by ourselves. We don't do anything together. Very, very few things we do together. And so Rick now is the teacher of the year. Uh, he and, and Eileen uh, went to an event together. So they connected. Uh, Pam and Rick went to another school yesterday, right? Yesterday. 
on his request. He invited Pam. And so there's, I, I, and, and, and he invited me to go to something in my side of the state that he's going to in February. I don't know what the fear is of seeing us together, board members <laughs> with Teacher of the Year, board members with our superintendent, board members with <coughs> uh, the staff. We are identities that should be working together, should be seen together, because we all work for the same common uh, ground, and that's to educate all students. So in my mind, I say, why are we afraid to do anything together? So when John brought the idea of let's meet together and do something in the near future, I go for that because we don't do anything together. We are not a silo and we're not going to achieve uh, top 10 of 10 in 10 years if we don't work together. So uh, Rick, thank you so much for being the, the teacher of the year that you are and for being inclusive because this is all what it's all about, being inclusive. I met with Rick secretly. Okay, see, another one. <laughs> <laughs> and so did you, Michelle. Yeah. All right, and any other And any I will next one, just so the record. I guess you're going alphabetically. <laughs> well. Uh, oh, no, no, go ahead. I, I just have a, I had a question with the ESSA and with the state. Mm -hmm. so, the, so when someone under the, under the old um, federal law, there was requirements that if you were found to be failing in certain amounts of times due to these test scores, that you would have to be closed, <coughs> um, basically closed, or half of your um, staff laid off. So it's had some really, um, to me, counterproductive uh, punishments um, as a result of um, doing poorly on test scores. So. Is that still in place? Are there um, in our state? Is that something that is being reconsidered, or th with that uh, being moved? And also, the I know we have state law that looks at the evaluation of teachers um, because it was pushed by the waivers um, to be on, on test scores. So I don't know. So the the idea, of, so the, the sort of the punitive effects of the. Um, former federal law, are they still in there? Is that something that's up for discussion? Or is that just going to be around that, that, that's, taken, so? that's removed. We, we can set our own uh, corrections, whatever we think was the best thing to do. But, uh, this, according to the federal law, but now some of that is it's also a state, a state yeah, law. So how much is that? Is but according to this law? new ESSA, that that requirement, that those restrictions are out. Oh God, but we still but have to so understand it. How much are they in the state and how much of them are, they're not in state law. So right, and that's just going to answer. Right. Okay. So, um, so you asked a, a couple questions. Um, kind of as an overarching thing, uh, one of the things that we're very committed to, and the superintendent alluded to this, is uh, we have an opportunity with ESSA to build an, an ass assessment accountability and support system that supports our 10 and 10 goals. So we really want to make sure we understand what we're trying to do in terms of becoming a 10 and 10 state and then have an assessment accountability and support system that drives toward that. Your specific question was about low performing schools. So ESSA um, retains the concept of identifying schools who are lower performing, um, but also introduces the idea of different ways to measure that, um, introduces the concept of requiring uh, a, another non-academic indicator. So that's very much, and the, the accountability vision committee that the superintendent convened coupled with the stakeholder work we'll need to do on ESSA, you know, does kind of suggest that um, we would want to look at how we're identifying those schools. And then it does move away from the prescribed four models that were in previous ESEA, so the, the four turnaround models. It just says the state has to have a plan for what they're going to do when they identify schools with these sort of um, low performance or, or large gaps. And then your last question was about educator evaluations, which I think uh, Kathleen answered. Uh, it removes the federal requirement for educator evaluations. So, uh, you know, we can, and I think that's what we've been doing under the superintendent's leadership is asking uh, if educator evaluations are a best practice for improving student achievement in Michigan, then what does Michigan want to do absent any federal requirement to support teachers, to um, professionally develop teachers, and to focus on student achievement classrooms. So, uh, but we're really at the beginning of the process, and we have, um, 
enough time to make sure we know what our strategic goals are and that this assessment accountability and support system works in uh, working toward those goals, not perhaps disjoint from them. So uh, we don't have, a, we're, we're really working hard even internally to not prescribe answers yet. We want to understand what's in there. That's so we're really gathering information and then understand what our strategic vision is and then work with stakeholders to kind of come up with a plan. And U.S. had did build enough time in that there's a little bit more development space. So I had John and then Eileen. Well, and I think that's what I was, I'm delighted to hear all the forward movement because I was sort of alluding, trying to allude to that, that there's an opportunity with this to kind of move to whatever we, our version of what will work to help improve education and away from punitive formulae to how do you build the capacity and support the school that isn't uh, failing as teachers to get good at what they're doing, you know, get better and support them not in that kind of But so do we know the, who submits, who, ha who has to sign off on our plan is it the department under the board's um, leadership uh, alone, or does the governor or anybody else have to sign the, the plan? I mean, uh, these plans remain a, a negotiation between the state education agency and the federal U.S. Ed. Um, but like with ESEA right before, but even broader, there is very much an expectation that this be um, a, a large enterprise that encompasses more than even our traditional stakeholders. So. Uh, the governor, the legislature, a business community, uh, that's part of what in the next six months we really need to understand how we kind of broadly um, get people engaged in this discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, we see that as understanding what we're doing strategically through 10 and 10 and then get gathering input on how do we reach those goals, will these things help or not, what do people think? That's all healthy and good. I, someone asked me the question. Was it st the race to the top application that the governor also had to formally sign on? Can't be yeah. yeah. It, was, it wasn't the... Right. The state board president had a sign, too. Right. So, yeah. Eileen, please. Uh, I just wanted to point out that Michigan was one of six states that has legislation requiring an educator evaluation system. The rest really did it for either race to the top or... Uh, actually, they did it for race to the top, I think. But um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm hopeful... I. I um, I, I don't know how our legislation is going to play out because I don't know how many models you can have in the state and have teachers have portability and have some things that I think weren't considered when that legislation was, was uh, done. But I'm also really hopeful that whatever we end up with uh, does the right job by teachers and does the right job by children because um, regardless of political pressures, that's the, that's the goal. I think we have an opportunity with educator evaluation, sorry, um, to uh, we didn't do it because of race to the top. We have we have the opportunity to say as a state, do we believe this is important? Can these be used in support of professional development, encouraging practice in our educators, and to learn the lessons from the states that went out ahead and maybe led with some of the more aggressive parts of educator evaluation, build a system that focuses on that professional development, continuous improvement. So I think, I think we're in a good position where maybe not getting those race to the top dollars ultimately was a blessing in disguise and gives us a chance to do this well. So, yeah. Yeah. so I just, I guess um, for me, just following up from this morning, and I did get a chance to talk to, to Kyle, and I mentioned this in a couple of meetings before and mentioned it here earlier today, is in regard to the Flint um, school system and the fact that they're falling under the early warning um, and seeing if um, we can look at their school count data they are inundated with so many things right now, um, but having to look at the D, falling under DTMB for the early warning and possibly also under the, um, uh, what the SRO is doing, um, I would imagine that that's a lot for them right now if there's anything that we can do um, to look at that issue and address that issue. Um, Again, um, as it relates to Brian, I'm happy to see that you're a part of the interagency um, working group, but to see if this is something that can be ongoing. We have issues that have been stated <coughs> in Detroit that are environmental issues, um, the conditions as well, the learning environment as well as the physical environment of the students. Um, as it relates to the um, physical environment of the, the students, one of the things that comes to mind for me, and I know Brian, you said that you will be meeting with them, is the bond funding, I mean, how does that, are we at all um, held accountable for any of that, but how are these school buildings 
in the shape that they are, or it's stated that they are, and there were recent bond funds that were um, allocated for the condition of the buildings. The other thing I would like to know is um, um, Lamar Lemons was here, and I know that you're going to follow up, Brian. It seemed like there was an ask of the board as well as it relates to, you know, what we can do for the board, local board. Um, are, do they have, um, looking at history, I'm the new person here. So looking at history, and I continue to hear this, what rights do the board have? Were, were there any missteps that were taken that have taken away the rights of that school board? As it relates to the city manager, I did not bring this up earlier, but we have, um, speaking of early, we have a, um, uh, 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 emergency manager that was in place in Flint as well as in Detroit. These two urban districts that are really facing some um, critical issues and um, that this person was there um, for both of those instances. What can we do? And I've been asked to demand his resignation. Um, so these are things that you'll be talking, you're, you're calling upon him. Are there any things that we as a board um, have any power over, um, and that would be to this board as well as you'll be having these discussions, Brian, as well. So I just wanted to bring those um, those things up. All right, thank you, uh, Richard. Richard and then John. Hey, uh, this is new topic. Okay. Doesn't matter. It's open mic night. Okay. <laughs> All right. Karaoke. All right. Uh, first off, um, on the report of the superintendent, we didn't get a hard copy of that, did we? Nope. Okay. We? okay. I just want to make sure I'm not missing something. I always like to take a look at the grants, and I really appreciate the department now putting the uh, the amount of the grants there. And of course, that figure, 465 and a half million, kind of jumped out at me. So I, I took a, lot, a look at the Title One Part A uh, to see how that was distributed. <clears throat> 102 million were the uh, Detroit Public Schools, and they're allocated separately for the EAA schools. But I, I totaled up to about uh, 18 million. So you got 120 million, um, a full quarter of the of the state's uh, Title One going to say Detroit. And I, I note that for two reasons. Number one, that, that's where the need is, obviously. Uh, but it also shows meaningful uh, supplemental uh, help. That amounts to over 2,000 uh, per student, uh, over and above the <coughs> state uh, school tuition grant. Now, the next largest district was Flint with 14 million. Uh, Dearborn and one other district had 10 million and all the others were, were less than that. And um, the second largest district in Michigan, Utica, uh, received only 3 million, a little over 3 million uh, of, this, of this money. There were, an, interestingly enough, a couple of charter schools uh, uh, in uh, the city of Detroit and maybe, if, maybe some outside that received as much as a million uh, in this uh, title. Uh, Title I funds indicating that those charters also serve a uh, significant portion of uh, students uh, in poverty. Um, and I don't know if anyone from the department has any other uh, comments on the Title I distribution here, but I just thought I'd think aloud about that with the colleagues and just to, I mean, when, when there's $465 million being distributed, we should probably note that. Absolutely. Okay. And you know, it is done by percentage of free and reduced lunch is the figure and how it's determined. So it's a formula based. Yeah. Uh, I had John first, if oh. you're done. I'm done. John, and then I'll come to Kathleen. To Pam's um, point about Lamar's um, presentation, or I'm not sure exactly what his letter was asking us for, but if, if it was um, support for a return to a democratically elected board um, or governance, you know, our Declare resolutions uh, are basically said as much. So I don't know if that is the total answer to Lamar's request, but I agree with Pam, we should figure out how to respond to the ask. And it seems like their ask is, from what I understand and what I've gathered, is a little different. Theirs is that board that has been elected to do the administrative all leadership administration portions as listed in the state constitution. 
Okay, so we uh, owe an answer on that. Kathleen? Piggyback on what Richard said. First of all, I appreciated the change in the format of the, what the grants report that we get. It was, it was clearer, I thought, than the previous one. And I noticed these these amounts, too, in that, in that 478. And one, one charter school, the Blanche Kelso Academy, got, oh, $478,000, apparently, uh, which was a lot for a charter school. <coughs> it was way above everything else. And I, so that was a question I had, too. And I know it, that's for delinquent youth, and the program is for, I, I don't know if well, the whole program is to deal with delinquent youth, and that might be why, uh, uh, that was the one that got three million, Utica didn't have that many. Yeah, yeah. Utica only got right. three and a half million. Uh, right, it was, uh, that's, that's probably why it was. But uh, that was, I was surprised that one charter school got so much and why. Yeah, it's all formula based based on the number of students, the number of free and reduced lunch. Okay. So it's a mathematical equation. Yeah. Okay. So, but I wanted to. It, also it's not an optional thing. I am really, I'm very concerned about what's happening in Detroit. What ha has happened to Detroit public schools? And I, I'm glad that you have said you want to meet with key people and try to come up with. <coughs> I would certainly like to be involved in doing that too. Uh, you know, having meetings, I don't know if we'll be invited or not, but I would appreciate it. Uh, so I, it, it's just, to me, it's just outrageous what has happened to the Detroit public schools. And I know some of it is demographic, but not all of it is demographic. And some of it is public policy that has been set by the state that has helped that it, that movement of destroying the Detroit public schools a lot, and I think it's it's just <coughs> just terrible, and it's 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 such a sad thing to see a, a school district that was a leader in the <coughs> country for years disintegrate before our eyes, and, and we 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 should be able to do something to stop it. So we we should do anything we can, everything we can. <coughs> Save the district and, and bring it back to its former glory. All right, with that, tentative agenda for the next meeting. If you have anything you'd like on the agenda, please let myself, John, or anyone on the committee know Cassandra, Michelle, or Marilyn. Um, future meeting dates, we did talk about maybe a special meeting coming up, but we'll more stay tuned on that. We have Tuesday, February 9th, 9.30 regular meeting, Tuesday, March 8th, 9.30 regular meeting, and Tuesday, April 12th, 9.30 regular meeting. And with that, we are adjourning at 2.55.